these technologies are now built together and brought together in a way that allows you to essentially establish a primary care relationship with all of the services associated with it that starts in technology. There's a world of smarts that is associated with technology that springs into life when healthcare encounters happen all over a digital platform. I remember walking into the first board meeting after I became CEO and put this together, and I took all the slides out and had a picture of Mike Tyson, who said, everybody's got a strategy till they get punched in the face. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take it. My name is Stephen Krein. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Startup Health. I am thrilled to be here with actually some old friends. Uh, Roy Schoenberg, the co-CEO of Amwell, and Murray Brzezinski, who's now the chief strategy officer of Amwell, the former CEO of, of Conversa Health, uh, a startup health company uh, that goes back many years from the founding of, of, uh, of Conversa. And what I'm really excited about doing today is digging in not just to uh, the story of Amwell and Conversa and the combination of the two last year, but really getting inside a little bit of the, 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 the belly of the beast, so to speak, and learning a little bit about from the entrepreneur's perspective, how you navigated uh, the ups, the downs, the obstacles, the opportunities in a way that I think will shed light for entrepreneurs, in innovators, and investors at how to really build uh, a sustainable long-term health innovation company and continually making sure that you stay on mission for what it is that you're working on. So I am Thrilled to be here. I'm going to ask you, ask you, actually ask you both to do quick intros and tell your story both about the the, the company, uh, the company and the founding of the company, but more importantly, your own personal backgrounds a little bit as we bring these together. I'm going to start with you, Roy, and give you a chance to introduce yourself. I always find that people doing their own introductions always nets the most interesting facts versus the narrative that the team gives me to read off. Roy, Mary, wow. welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. It's always, you know, always end up we're having such fun conversations. So it's really good to, to be back here. Um, introduction wise. So I think you can you can judge from my kind of a little bit funny accent that I wasn't born here. I was born in Israel many, many, many years ago, last century. Uh, took my time in Israel, trained as a physician there um, and then came to Boston for a little bit of an academic stint here. Um, and then, you know, through two other previous companies that I founded with my brother uh, over the years, then got to Amwell back in 2006 um, with the idea that we can we can actually deliver healthcare over technology. Uh, this is at the time to remind everybody before the iPhone was invented. So it was a leap. And then I would say probably spent the first 10 years of of building Amwell, trying to convince clinicians and the forces of nature in, in healthcare that it is safe for clinicians and patients to interact over technology rather than put their hands on the patient chest and abdomen. Um, and then the last 10 years or so, I would say, are all about growth, are all about, you know, essentially surfing the wave of recognition that, of course, kind of peaked in, in, uh, in COVID that healthcare, like other industries, can actually have a digital arm for its operation. Uh, and of course, everything trickles down from that. So that's in a very brief way, the life story. Excellent. And, um, and I'm going to ask, we're going to come back and, and talk a little bit about the mission when you launched uh, As American Well back in, in 2000, and I want to say six-ish. Um, and, and hear about that journey. But before we do, I'm going to give Murray a chance to introduce himself as well. Sure. <clears throat> Steve, great to be here with you and Roy, of course. Um, 
introduction. I mean, I, I've always thought of myself as a creator. So I've thought of ideas that need to be manifest in the world. And some of them should be through, you know, creating something through writing. A lot of it is through entrepreneurship and creating companies, technology. So I got into technology years ago in different industries. And like a lot of people, I got into healthcare through a personal uh, family health situation with my wife. And it just put into high relief, you know, the problems with the healthcare system that we're still grappling with. And this was 15 years ago and we had great access and it was still very difficult to understand, to navigate, to make decisions, lack of visibility, lack of data. Um, and so I said, I'm going to take my experience in technology and data and get into healthcare. And when that opportunity presented itself, I, I got into healthcare and helped to found a number of companies, Healthline and Talix, different parts of healthcare. Converse is one I didn't found. Good friends of mine, Wes Shell and Phil Marshall, who I've worked with at other uh, ventures, founded it. We'll talk about the founding vision and mission in a bit. But um, I was involved very early on because I was there when we were conceiving the company and I was the first reference for their uh, initial investors. So I was there from the beginning in a, in a way while I was busy building other companies and then had the opportunity to join and take over the company right in the teeth of COVID. Um, and uh, we had a really great uh, vision and mission, all of which was blown up by, by COVID. And we had to make some pivots, which we'll talk about. And uh, we were lucky enough to uh, meet with Amwell at the right time. And uh, it's been a, a really great marriage. As you mentioned, it, it uh, consummated in August of 21. So we're going on just about a year now and we're past the honeymoon phase. So I can say definitively that it's been uh, the right decision on every dimension and it's been a wonderful experience. Excellent. Like on, on that on that note, actually, let's talk a little bit about the acquisition. We know uh, about American Well and Amwell. We know about Conversa and its journey. What were some of the reasons, Roy, behind why Conversa was so interesting to you? And um, given that we're coming up on the one year anniversary, how true some of those initial thoughts were uh, from your from your perspective now seeing inside the first year of, uh, of what you called the marriage, uh, uh, Murray? You know, first of all, I want to say that I think the years following the honeymoon year are actually better. You know, they're getting better and better over time. That's the aspiration, right, in all relationships that they get built. And that is the case here. I would say that, you know, the coming together period was, you know, not only meaningful on its own, but it was in the context of really a completely change of perception by the industry of what the various technologies can do for healthcare. This is COVID. You know, like it or not like it, clinicians and patients were introduced to telehealth because that was the only way for clinicians to practice their art. It was the only way for hospitals to sustain itself, themselves with patient care. And patients, especially those that were, you know, that, that needed a lot of health care, didn't have any other alternative. There's a lot of stories around what that meant, but I want to highlight one that brought us together with Conversa, which is like it or not the receptivity in the audiences of healthcare on the delivery, on the clinician side and the patient side, to the notion that a bigger part of your healthcare experience is going to happen over technology, that embrace literally opened up in COVID. And it is, when you think about it, it isn't just receptivity to telehealth, to live video visits like what we're doing what we're doing now, but it is receptivity to the fact that technology can play a role. And what that means is that we can expand the notion of how we can create companionship to patients for their healthcare journey with technology. When you kind of peel the onion to that kind of you know pithy statement, it's the understanding that at the end of the day, most of people's healthcare experience is actually not with clinicians. We spend, I don't know, 10 minutes with clinicians when we see them, if they're not too busy and not on their EHR typing stuff, and that's a whole other conversation. But we spend very little time in front of clinicians. Most of the time that we live with the realities of healthcare, with our living with chemotherapy for a cancer patient, or living with pain, or living with recovering from surgery, or whatever it is, you know, that journey is spent on our own. Now, healthcare has a lot to say and a lot to do to help us through that journey. It can 
guide us. It can reassure us. It can ask us questions. It can modify the way we get treated. It can modify the titrate our medications and do a lot of other things and sometimes say, hey, listen, you got to go to the ER because this is not going the right way. The problem is that healthcare isn't there because to put a clinician next to the patient during that journey would break the back. So that is where the magic of Conversa came in. It is the understanding that if we do it right, there is a role for the digital presence of healthcare next to patients at all times. And that the beauty of it is that if that companionship with that patient can not only be there for them during that time, but also if, for whatever reason, things are not going well with the patient, it can raise its hand and bring in the cavalry, get that patient in front of the <clears throat> clinicians. Then we are really moving the needle on people's healthcare experience. I think that the, the beauty of that, you know, joining forces is that we, re we really didn't try to change what either company was doing. Amwell, American Well of, you know, of, of prior to the merger is all about telehealth. You know, we, we bring patients and clinicians together to see one another and interact. Conversa, and Mary will tell the story way better than I do, Conversa is all about that digital automated companionship next to patients. That's very, very sensitive and discerning. It's the binding of the companies, but it's also the binding of the visions that allows us to really say, we can surround patients differently with technology. That's why that honeymoon is continuing to get better and better. Yeah, I love that. And I want to pick up on, on, on some recent announcements related to that convergence. But I want to turn uh, to Murray and, and ask, you know, for a lot of entrepreneurs who build companies or take on the role of CEO and, and leading a company, um, it's easy to see why, uh, no, I shouldn't say easy, but it's obvious to see why Roy felt it was so important to add another component to their already existing footprint and success in the in the telemedicine in the tel televisits but from your perspective as a as an up-and-comer company coming from where you were why what, what made it so obvious to you to do the same thing in other words it sounds like what 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 america well um, amwell was missing was clear and could be added and complemented and accelerated but how do you think about it from the conversa side yeah our, our mission really hasn't changed much from the beginning right which was basically how do we incorporate the, the wisdom of the patient, all the information you can capture from a patient and utilize that to help improve care and improve health. But the vision for how we achieve that mission or how we uh, pursue that mission changed over time. And COVID was a big catalyst for changing it. So when COVID hit, first of all, we had this very elaborate strategy. And I remember walking into the first board meeting after I became CEO and put this together. And I took all the slides out and had a picture of Mike Tyson who said, everybody's got a strategy till they get punched in the face. And so we had to rethink everything. And initially it was a lot of headwinds um, and we had to pivot and figure out how do we get into the tailwinds. And so the vision for the company kind of moved from, we're going to be the leader in automated care. And just, even though at our size, uh, we have a long way to go, we, we really took that mantle and became in, in, in our view, the lead there. But that vision changed from a leader in automated care to how do we become a complementary uh, care delivery model in the new hybrid care world that was emerging. And it became clearer what that hybrid care world emergence might look like because everybody moved to virtual visits, right? We can talk about the utilization going up dramatically and a lot more um, skipping of pilots and moving to, hey, we, we just need to use technology because we need to deal with COVID. And that became this sort of forcing function. And so we had a number of our customers come to us and in different ways, we're asking the question, how how can we get more out of you? We're going to go from working with 60 vendors down to six. We want you to be one of them. What's a natural other things that we should be thinking about from Conversa, which forced us probably sooner than we wanted to, to think about raising a lot of money and potentially acquiring, becoming part of other platforms. And so it got us thinking a little bit ahead of where we normally would have been around what is our role in this hybrid care world. And we started to have discussions. There was a lot of interest. We were doing very well. And initially the screen was, are you a platform? That was the first kind of screen. And Amwell came through with this vision around hybrid care platform. They were mm -hmm. further along than us. We, it became clear that we were a piece in a broader platform more logically than trying to build that platform ourselves, given the speed at which um, platforms were scaling. Um, 
And a number of companies came through that screen, but then it became very clear when we started to compare our actual mission, our commitment to that mission, the values, the people, the DNA of the companies, and uh, we didn't go through a process. So once we started to have that discussion, it became clear that Amwell was the right partner for us. And uh, we only we only engaged with Amwell at the end of the day doing the deal. Excellent. Well, you know, uh, we were thrilled. We've known um, you and West and, and Roy and Ito for, for, for a long time. And so, of course, as both a startup health company, as a friend of you both, we were thrilled. Um, but we know a year later what's really worked and what's working well. Just to get, bring some reality to it, what were some of the challenges, maybe unexpected or, 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 or otherwise, that you kind of dealt with in the first year of integration? And I, either one, you know, I think has a different, each of you obviously has different perspectives of that, but I'd love to hear some of that for the entrepreneurs who are listening today. You know, I can take a stab at it. Murray can, can, can add his perspective. And we're probably not synchronized here. So I probably have different, different views of this. But I think that the biggest challenge is that you're coming <laughs> in as two companies, you know, especially if you're coming in as two two strong companies that have, you know, a very, very lively agenda. The the kind of the default is that you continue working in parallel, right? We have a tremendous world of things that on the annual side prior to the prior to the merger and you know we had to deliver and we wanted to continue to live up to all the things that we promised the market and the same you know was the reality on the converse side they have a, a world of customers that want to grow and add capabilities and so on and someone somehow in the midst of all of this you have to say hang on i need to somehow squeeze this aside and create another capacity in the middle that would not only integrate the two, but will the, that you know statement take one plus one and make it three, and that is always a challenge if you have two companies that have very very active commitments in the market because the market is driving forward. That you know the blessing and the curse of COVID. The blessing is the fact that we were able to come together. That both companies were. You know, we're doing really well on the day of, of the merger. The curse is that we were all tasked already prior to the merger, and then we had to squeeze something out of nothing. I think that's partly the reality of, of any two companies that come together, but it was especially true, you know, because these technologies were were so much at center stage during the, the years of COVID. Um, just to double click on that, um, there was a question that came in that you answered in the Q&A from uh, Dr. Alex Greenhill, who asked you, you could conceivably have tried to build the Conversa capabilities, conceivably, I say, uh, she says, uh, but using your funding and dev teams, what made you buy instead of build? Yeah, so I think the, you know, the answer is, is somewhat simplistic. I said, we, we could potentially throw money at the problem and try to build capabilities. I think you know, we probably could. What you can't build is the art and we've learned you know we all or some of us have gray hair and you know scars from working in healthcare for you, for you don't years. seem to have any gray hair but that's oh, i do i do it's, it's a camera it's a camera that's <laughs> but, uh, but one of the lessons learned you know is that it, whatever you want to do and be successful in healthcare capabilities don't cut it it's understanding understanding how they mesh into the value model of the people that you sell to, your the success of whatever products you have depends maybe 30% or 40% on how good you are, another 30 or 40% on how the other people are, and 20% on circumstances and legislation. So I think that the, the, the one wonderful thing about Conversa is that they made it work already, not the features and functions, they made the value come to life in the hands of customers. No matter how much capabilities we build, it will take us a decade to get there. I love that. I think it's a really important reminder, especially as other companies go through, whether it's M&A discussions or fundraising discussions about yeah. answering that, the, the, the ultimate question almost every entrepreneur gets, which is why do they, you know, why would they buy you when they can build it? Or why are you going to add the kind of value you're adding um, just around this capability? So I appreciate that. Murray? You know, from the other side of, of the, you know, of the table, I think that's exactly right. You, the it that you're buying, to Roy's point, isn't capabilities. It's a successful business. So unless you have the domain knowledge and you're focused in a particular area, and there's just a lot that goes into it when you think about build buy. Um, 
But as far as challenges, again, I agree with everything Roy said. We came in, the, the challenge was really too much opportunity. So how do you prioritize? Which I would argue is still the challenge for the company today. And if you want to have a challenge, that's the right it's the challenge you hope for, but it's still uh, problematic and you have to you know, really deal with it. I am a big fan of you know, quantifying and statistics and everything else. I'll, I'll give you a stat that suggested how we rose to the challenge. And, and this is a testament to, to Amwell and, and what Roy said before, which was recognizing that there's art, that there's magic. Um, and you know, how do you bring two companies together that are successful, that already have customers and have a strong mission and vision and make it one, we lost no employees through the process. No, no employees that, that we didn't want to lose through this process to date, to date. Um, and that's an enormous, that doesn't happen in my experience yeah. in MA. And it's because people really bought in very strongly to the Conversa mission and vision. And when we did this, it was very, very clear that we were now becoming part of a larger, uh, longer term mission and vision. And we always built this again, as I said before, we had the mission, but the vision just got expanded very naturally to we're really a care delivery model and it needs to be used seamlessly with other care delivery models that exist. Amwell was starting to build the other capabilities to support those business models. And when I say um, um, delivery models, we're, we both looked at it as support, right? So Amwell has been very, very consistent that it's an infrastructure in support of the uh, the health delivery organizations and the payer organizations and life science organizations. And that was our philosophy as well. So although we had challenges, um, I think they were relatively um, expected. And now it's all about prioritization. How do we make sure we deliver on promises that we made previously? Well, looking forward and, and really focusing on those things that are going to have the biggest impact in the shortest period of time from for the most patients. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, from what we see, even having a, 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 a CEO, a part of the company a year later, let alone all the employees still there is, is a testament, Roy, to the culture that you and the team built over the last uh, 15 years. H how would you like, if you were to, if you were to kind of write the framework for the next decade of the company, how, how would you describe the, the, you know, 10 year vision today of what you want to accomplish um, so that when you look back, you're going to be really happy with the progress you made from 2022 to 2032. So funnily enough, and I think I think it's a it's a privilege to be part of a company that that has that reality. The mission statement of Amwell hasn't changed from 2006. I don't know if it was whatever we were you know thinking when we wrote it, but it it kind of survived the test of time in a way that the mission statement doesn't speak to a function. It doesn't speak to, we're going to build that capability that will be embraced by X, Y, or Z. It speaks to the evolution of technologies that are going to change and advance people's healthcare experience. And as such, those technologies are useful if they serve the traditional operators of healthcare. We're not trying to create a shadow world of telehealth that people will go to that will live, you know, side by side with the rest of their healthcare. We're trying to, to blend into their experience that they consume from, you know, from the hospitals they work with or the, the, the Blue Cross Blue Shields that cover them or whatever it is. That statement actually works today. I think that the, you know, the, the, the joining of Conversa and Amwell is an example of that because what it really changes is it changes the experience. It, it allows people to go home from whatever healthcare building they were in, whether it's an outpatient clinic or a hospital or whatever it is, and feel that healthcare continues around them. If you ask me about where that needs to be 10 years from now, I would actually say it's a continuation of the same. I think that the reality is that there is going to be a shift further and further of healthcare to where we as patients want to be, which is not in a hospital, not in an exam room, not in a waiting room, but rather in our own reality. And that's going to be true not only for, for you know, people that have an anecdotal healthcare experience, but mainly for people that require a lot of healthcare, elder care, graceful aging, you know, people that have polychronic conditions and so on. More and more of their healthcare surrounding is going to be done via technology inside their environment. 
Now, that can be broken into a lot of different things. That is where conversational AI comes in. That is where biosensors and you know biometrics are coming in. That is where monitoring of the data that's coming from those devices comes in. That's where the ability for someone to walk through your television set at home to check up on you for a couple of minutes, your nurse from the hospital, click, click, come in. How are you? You know, did you take your medication? That kind of stuff. A lot of complementary services that can actually come into your home occasionally to make sure that you're eating well or draw your blood or whatever it is. There is a whole world of elements, some of which Amwell is part of and some of which will work with in order to create a healthcare reality around patients that is where where they want to be. Um, and I think it's a it's it's just a a long journey that will constantly continue. There's not going to be a we have arrived kind of a you know a period. Um, but that's what makes it nice, right? I mean, that's what makes us get up in the morning and continue to innovate. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to use that as a jumping off point for Murray, because clearly you've been living in this world of automating the care experience. Um, give me an example or two of what kind of automation, uh, what, what has automation done to change that experience? And I'd love an example today, but then I'd love an example in the future that is not possible today, but will be because of, of what you're doing together uh, at Amwell. Sure. You know, it's a great question. You know, so when people think about automation, they think your head immediately goes to back office, administrative, offloading activities. We actually, and that's and it's huge, a lot of value there, but we, we chose automating the care delivery. So we, we chose a really hard problem at the beginning, which was, you know, right in the clinical workflow, you got to get it right. You know, we've talked a lot, we've talked a lot about experience. It all starts with the experience, because if you don't have the experience that works for patients, they won't stay engaged. If you don't have experience with providers where they feel it works in their workflow, they won't stay engaged. And therefore you can't, you, you, that's the first step. But, you know, there was a time, and Steve, you know this, at all these conferences where, you know, you have themes and patient engagement for years was a theme. And I was, was, I was befuddled by it because it's not an end, it's a means to an end, right? You're getting them engaged for some reason. People wanna get healthy, they wanna stay healthy, they want improved care. And so, in, in automation, we started with let's improve the experience, but our whole purpose for doing that was let's get engagement so we have permission to collect the wisdom from the patient. They'll give us information because they are having a good experience. They know it's good for them. They know it's being used to improve their care. And we've done a really good job and we've evolved. And now we're very focused on leveraging that data to help make decisions that change behaviors that are predictably and reliably moving the needle on outcomes. And that's ultimately the business that we're in. And so I'll give you some examples. We, we um, announced this recently uh, on the last earnings call. Ido talked about it. Spectrum Health is a, a, a large healthcare system in Michigan, one of our longstanding customers. And they're using lots of different programs, our automated programs, but one of them is for the um, dis patients that are discharged or released from the emergency department. Thousands upon thousands, 20,000 patients over the last year. They did a study on those patients and changing the experience, it was enormous. So 90% satisfaction, patients loved it. Basically, it's a program when you leave the emergency department, you get enrolled in it as a patient. It's following up to make sure that you understand those discharge instructions. Usually 10 minutes later, you forget 90% of what you're supposed to do. It's confusing. It creates stress. So it checks in, makes sure you understand that, continually reinforces it. It makes sure that you're going to your follow-up appointments. It makes sure that you're getting your scripts if you've had a prescription written. It's making sure that when you run into problems, you don't change your pain meds and do something dangerous that results in you getting back to the emergency department. And so very good experience. Patients gave it very high marks. The providers and the care teams that were using it we're making on average 30 calls a day to patients to follow up when they were being released. It reduced the number of calls they were making by 70%. So the burden and burnout on those care teams went down. Satisfaction rates went through the roof. They started using it as a recruiting tool. People were lining up to be in this emergency department because of this platform that they were able to use to provide better care for patients. And then the actual outcomes, uh, it reduced total cost of care utilization of the emergency department and admission to the hospital to the point where Spectrum went to their health plans and said, this one program is saving you for the patients that are on value-based programs with us over a million dollars a year. So about $85 per enrolled patient savings from reduced utilization, more savings from 
care teams and providers being able to focus and practice at the top of their license and not make all these unnecessary calls. So that's an example of right now in the moment, being able to check with the patient, take their perspective of how they're doing, answers to questions, validated answers to questions in the form of PROs, biometric readings, and in the moment, make a decision as to what the status is of that patient. And based on that status, decide what the next best action for the patient could be. That's what we're doing today. Love that. What is going to be done or what should we expect from the, the, the capabilities and the experience five or 10 years from now? And while what you just described, I know, would be a big leap forward from today, um, what, what, what does it look like where more data is available, more of the experience has been improved upon, and you've already accomplished that? Is there, is there kind of a set of things that you'll be able to do five or 10 years from now that we can't do today? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as Roy talked about, again, the experience talked about TVs. And so one, different modalities, different ways of being able to engage patients. So right now we're doing it on, you know, devices with browsers, but that can be extended to TVs and voice devices and other things. So the idea is a companion wherever you are, right? And you can access it as a patient, as a, a caregiver, as a family member, wherever you might be. Um and then the other thing is I talked about all the data that we have making decisions in the moment for the next best action. The next vista there is using that information. You might look good right now. Your status might be fine, but we can predict that you're going to decompensate tomorrow, next week, in a month. Or we can predict that the probability, the likelihood of a readmission based on a risk score just increased. And so we can recommend an intervention when things look good. And that really fulfills this promise of moving from reactive to proactive care. So the whole idea right now is we've automated and virtualized the ability for someone effectively to sit with you as a patient every day in your home and ask you the right questions, take the right readings and make the right recommendation. The next step is that person that we virtualized and automated is going to be able to be more omniscient and predict what may happen next so we can provide guidance for the care teams to intervene at the appropriate time. Love that. And and I'm assuming, and I want to turn it back to Roy, re- related to the announcement I saw recently about um, Amwell powering the CVS health rollout of their uh, virtual primary care service. How, how does that play a role? Because I'm assuming that what you just described, Mary, what you outlined, uh, Roy, uh, is one thing to offer it, but it's another thing to actually reach the patients and the families where they are. And clearly, CVS brings you right into, you know, communities all around the country that um, enables you to put that into action. So maybe elaborate a little bit on how meaningful that is, Roy, and what the expectation there is. Yeah, I think funnily enough, and I really haven't thought about it until you ask it that way, um, it ties to the first the first question that we had today, or the, the, the first conversation part, where we talked about people's openness to changing the model by which traditional healthcare has been delivered. I think that the conversation about virtual primary care is is actually an earthquake. It means that your first line of defense for your healthcare issues, your primary care, is going to start with this. And then recognizing that just putting it on the phone is not going to be enough, you actually have to tie it into the kind of escalation path of care, sometimes it can be solved over the phone, even when you talk to a clinician, and then you have to go into a physical location, and sometimes someone has to put a stethoscope on your chest, and sometimes blood needs to be drawn, and that needs to be escalated to a physician office, and that goes into an outpatient clinic and a hospital and admission and acute care and all that kind of stuff. The understanding that there is an opportunity for us to rewrite care settings completely and how they work with one another, kind of the chain of transmission of electrons to anybody that remembers chemistry, the ability to rewrite those care settings and tie them together differently is at the core of introducing virtual primary care. Now, it really helps that you have the technology in place. It really helps that you know how clinicians want to work with the technology because virtual primary care still allows you to see a real physician, to be clear. It's not, that part is not automated. You actually have a relationship with a PCP. So you understand how PCPs work, but you change the consumption of healthcare to something that is much more compatible with how 
people want to be, you know, come to them, try to bring it into their reality. The notion that they have to queue up in front of healthcare is kind of gone. It's outdated. Um, so, and, and of course, I, I don't have to, you know, speak for, for CVS. They, they do a good job doing that. But they do have a presence that's very close to a lot, a lot of where people live. So that is an opportunity for them to really think about merging all of these things together to rewrite the way people experience the consumption of healthcare. You know, I would say that the, the fact that that is happening right in front of our eyes is, is unbelievable. If you asked me that question five years ago, I would, I would have not predicted that this would happen that fast. But uh, I don't know if we want to talk about virtual primary care or not, but I would say that I think that is people, I think, are underestimating how dramatic the effect of this is going to be on the entire industry. So let, let's, uh, you, you're teasing me here. Let's dig into that. I mean, I think, um, I think what you're describing, and it's a little bit like um, people talking about a cure for certain, you know, things like type one diabetes. It's always right around the corner. It's always right there, but it, then it's, you know, it, it's inevitably like the horizon. It, you know, when you get there, it's just yep, it's a little another. further, a little further. Um, let, you know, I, I recall not that long ago, it was a big deal just to be able to, you know, go see, a, a, you know, a, a urgent care at a CVS or a Walgreens. And that was going to herald in a whole new, a, a whole new era. Um, what you're describing is exciting. Why is this different, a different moment for, for, for the emergence of and the actual implementation of and acceptance of that impact being felt at you know the 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 home in a, a particular part of the country which might not have even good for, good primary care in their in their community so i think i think the the reason <clears throat> i mean we can talk about technology all day long i think that the people hate the term paradigm shift but sometimes it's appropriate to use it for the most part telehealth technologies have been used in a variety of transactional ways urgent care is a very good reality, right? I mean, please don't quote me on that. It, it, it's an instrument of blind dating, right? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a patient who has a need right now. They're going into a system that matches them with an available clinician. They come together. Good healthcare happens. But for the most part, they part ways very likely never to see each other again. Transactional. Very transactional, which is a blessing when you need transactions. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with transactions. But... Inevitably, a lot of healthcare requires more than transactions. The, the term inside the industry is the notion of longitudinal care. When you have a chronic condition or when you, even when you have an, an, an episode of care that, that extends over a period of time, like recovery from something or, you know, or something that extends, that is when you need relationships. Short-term, long-term, but relationships. One of the elements that is so profoundly different about virtual primary care is that these technologies are now built together and brought together in a way that allows you to essentially establish a primary care relationship with all of the services associated with it that starts in technology. It sounds subtle, but it spells a complete rewrite of the journey of patients and the consumption of services in healthcare. There are a lot of other elements to it, which I think are, you know, are, are, are lost on a lot of people. It's not just that you can get a PCP on your phone and have a PCP relationship. It's because those early steps, you know, when you raise your hand as a patient to your PCP and say, hey, something is wrong with me, in many cases, spells out a journey of acquisition of you know, imaging studies and labs and 50 million other things that happen following that, the ability for us, because this is happening, the scene of the crime is now digital, happening on a digital platform, we have an open door to inject into that experience a lot of things like analytics, like best, you know, next action, um, preferential formulary for the patient that makes it less, you know, more affordable for them to take certain medication versus others. There's a world of smarts that is associated with technology that springs into life when healthcare encounters happen on, over a digital platform. So this is a much bigger, you know, earthquake 
than than people think at first. I, I love that, Mario. You want to add anything to that? Because I want to shift gears a little bit from the business to the back, the, 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 what happens backstage um, with with uh, navigating uh, the years, or in the case of Roy, you know, decade plus uh, of building a company. But Mario, you want to add anything to what Roy just articulated about the earthquake? That- yeah, I would just. Um, I know we started with uh, you know primary care, which I think in and of itself is an earthquake. I think. You know, just the time, if you think about what's happening in primary care, everything Roy just said, if you think about, you know, the elephant in the room with, you know, Amazon One Medical, I think that's a shot across the bow of the incumbents to invest in virtual first, invest in hybrid care in a real serious way. Mm -hmm. Because Roy said, if you want to move to a relationship from transactional and you want to avoid, I mean, let's be real, urgent care was really a, a solution to a problem where you couldn't get an appointment in the incumbent, right? You couldn't get an appointment with a primary care physician at your health system or at a practice. And so it became a convenience and it became a transactional. And, you know, the systems of, I think have learned. And so the fact that, you know, big tech is getting into, you know, this alternative shadow world is really an opportunity for the whole industry to move forward. So I think that's a big deal. And I think if I abstract what we're really doing, we're looking at time, place, and people. And we're saying, how do we optimize all of those things? In healthcare, time, place, and people, it's costing you know 20% of GDP. It's, to Roy's point, people don't want to be in the hospital. There's a lot of friction. There's a lot more conversation now on access and equity than there ever has been to the point where you know people are putting it on their, you know, their OKRs and health systems. People are being uh, compensated and measured against those things. And we really have a platform that's helping those systems optimize time, place, and people for the benefit of driving outcomes for patients. And I just think that's a complete paradigm shift from where we were pre-COVID. I think that's, you know, COVID was a panic. It was investment. It was deal with COVID. Then everything settled in and it was, we're losing $50 billion a month in the health system side. Uh, We need to do something about it to now this notion that it's not, you know, putting band-aids on it, but it's a fundamental reimagination of how we're going to deliver care in the future. So that's the point we're at now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we could spend hours talking about this this topic, but um, you you talked about transactional to transformational in terms of how the healthcare experience had occur, you know, really moves and maybe exponentially not only gets better, but you know, and, and improves, but 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 is transformed. I want to use that same metaphor to talk a little bit about mindset. And Murray, you know this from being in startup health a, a, as a portfolio company and community member for so many years. The power of mindset is so impactful. It can attract, um, especially coming from a leader, it can attract investors and customers and partners and team members, but can all, it can also repel them, right? H- how important um, is, is and was uh, and continues to be mindset in getting up every day and enabling us to have that transformational experience you're talking about? I know we've talked about mission, we've talked about your business, but I, I I can see it every day how 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 pivotal mindset is and how it plays a role in everything that we do as entrepreneurs and everything we do as humans. But as entrepreneurs leading companies, it's the thing that matters most. I think it's it is. I mean, it's not only critical, Steve, but I mean, obviously you're leading the witness. But I think it's it is the, it's the most important thing, right? Because it, it, it's about people. As Roy said before, I mean, we could have the best technology, the best product, but all that's built by people as well. And, you know, is it from the startup perspective, it's hard enough in any environment, right? Most startups fail, the odds are against you. Um, so mindset is critical. And then, you know, with COVID, it became, you know, exhausting on top of all the uncertainty and everything else. And so as a leader to be able to show up, you can't have all the answers. You can't, you, you, you can't fake, you know, you're, you're in it with your, your team. And so, you know, sharing how you really feel, being vulnerable, um, crowdsourcing, you know, we're a team, the solutions, there's no one person that's going to solve the problems, recognizing that uh, we're going to have setbacks. How do you deal with setbacks and failures is way more important than successes. It's great to celebrate the successes, but, um, you know, what do you do when, when you get the punch in the face, which we got over and over and over again as a startup and then, compound that with with covid so you know i you always hear people say it's not a sprint it's a marathon i think you're in a different race at different times sometimes it is a sprint sometimes it's a series of sprints sometimes it's a marathon sometimes it's a relay race we when we have discussions about this with our teams throughout the whole uh life cycle of conversa when when do we need to 
have which mindset to make sure that we're going to be successful to be in the next race, right? It's always about getting to the next race. To Roy's point before, there's no end game. It's not like we're going to get to a point and we're going to be done, right? We get to a point, you might take a breath and look back and say, look how far we've come. And then we look up and we say, we're at base camp to use Roy's analogy that he uses all the time. Wow, we made it to base camp. That's great. Let's celebrate. But we have a long way to go to get to the peak. And uh, to your point about the horizon, you know, that peak or that horizon keeps moving. So I think mindset is absolutely critical because mindset is really uh, the determinant of culture, right? And culture is all about how you're going to motivate the team you have and attract, uh, continue to attract the best people so you can actually uh, deliver on your, your mission. I just want to add, because it's such a critical question, and thank you for asking it. When you get to the point that you have a product and you want to sell it to customers and customer, large customers in healthcare, I think what eventually they sign up for is not your features and functions. They sign up for a partnership with you, and that is driven by your mindset, and that is driven by your honesty, and that is driven by your problem solving. And it's good that you have a good product. It means that it worked in the past and grew, but it is the mindset that they partner with. So, you know, more than anything, I think that that is the distinction between people that succeed in this industry and people that don't. So thank you for asking that question. Well, I, I mean, I, I think I, it must be obvious that um, mindset played a role in both of you filtering this trend, this, the transaction um, that, that was consummated a year ago to it being a transformational partnership. But really that, that, that framework of mindset playing such a big role is often mistaken for fluffy stuff that's kind of out there because people focus on the capabilities of the technologies. Um, from, from your standpoint, what do you do? Uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask Roy, cause I, I, I probably know the answer on Mary, but what do you do to kind of recalibrate your mindset, your mindset when you're feeling it either slip or in the wrong zone? Who feels in the wrong zone ever? You, no. you with your own, with your no. own mind. Look, we all, we all, we all love to believe we that we're always in that transformational zone. We're always thinking that way. But when, by the way, this could be personal or professional. Some things happen in life and days and certain no days are harder than others. What are you doing to recalibrate your mindset? Listen to others. I mean, the, the, this is only going to work when there are checks and balances when people give you a mental or a, an intellectual kind of checkpoint where you see you've gone too far left or right, up or down in your mindset, in your emotions, in your aspiration, in whatever it is, in your innovation, doesn't really matter. The contextualization of everything that you go through with the understanding of what's happening through the minds of the people around you is such a healthy grounding effect that it needs to become a regular part of what you do. The moment that you start thinking or drinking your own Kool-Aid and going too much alone on any dimension of, of your life, I think you get disconnected. And I think that leads to a lot of bad places. So just talk to the people around you. I, I want to shift gears to, to brand because both uh, uh, the original American Well and now Amwell was a brand at first just because it was the first and the most, you know, I remember it was at Hawaii was your first uh, place you launched. Like, I remember the promise of it in American Well, you know, as a brand was cemented around telemedicine. When Conversa came on this uh, on the scene, I think the same thing happened around the conversational AI and, and that. But how important is brand from the very beginning as a role, uh, you know, how, how big of a role did it play in, fundraising, customer development, team recruitment, because a lot of entrepreneurs think that comes with success. But for some reason, and I know with both of your organizations, because you both had companies before that built brands, you recognize that from day one. But I want to underscore that here. And if you could elaborate a little bit how important it was, is, and will be to the success of, of, of scaling what you've built and what you've done. I'll be very brief in saying that I think that the brand is the chassis on which you bring, you build credibility. And as people, people have to hone in the credibility and then pass it to others. They need to have a token by which they pass their respect to what you do or their appreciation of what you do. And that needs to be the, the, the purpose of the brand. By the way, whether it is to a 
buyer or whether it is to the end consumer. But the, the biggest deal is to build that credibility on top of the brand. It's not about the name that you find for yourself. It's about whether you position it so it becomes such a good container of that passage of credibility. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, I think brand is certainly not name. I, I think brand is trust, brand is credibility. And so from that perspective, it's it's extremely important. And, you know, for Conversa, you know, our brand, our credibility, and our trust in the market was way bigger than the company. We grew into the brand. So I think it became, it was very important in our, our success. I think Amwell uh, would probably say that we're probably say the same thing. I know right now as you know, we went through a process around what do we do with the brands of Conversa and Silver Cloud? They're powerful. They're strong. They have meaning, uh, convey trust and credibility in the minds of the customers that use them. And so we've, we have product brands that still carry those names. We want to have one platform and one brand uh, for the company, but even that brand, you know, Amwell is transitioning from, you know, re recognized as direct to consumer as well as B2B to be much more of an infrastructure. It's a support. So the, what the brand now means is you can rely on this infrastructure to drive the future of hybrid care, whether you're a health system or a payer or a life science company or an innovator that's providing services through the platform. So it, it conveys trust and credibility, but what it stands for and what it's signaling is, is constantly evolving. You know, it, it, it's it's interesting because I think um, whether it was building a brand back in the mid two thousands or building a brand in, in in the teens like Conversa, companies being born today or built today, especially in our sector and industry, and in, in, in so many ways, um, have different challenges. And 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 I'd love to hear what you would tell the entrepreneurs. And I want to pick two different groups of entrepreneurs. One group of entrepreneurs has been at it for a decade or more still trying to get the scale, the traction, the acceptance, and they have just enough to keep going, but not enough to forget, you know, to be fully, fully scaled. Um, and then the other group would be people starting today and what you would tell an entrepreneur building uh, a, a digital health, a biotech, a life science company today in this industry that has some of the, some of the tailwinds of a post COVID world, especially with digitization. So both, 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 both audiences, and I'd love you to both to kind of give, give us answers as we do the wrap up today. Yeah, I think it's you know it's a hard world to be successful in healthcare. I don't think that it's harder today than it was twenty years ago, or fifty years ago, or hundred years ago. Just you know the 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 currencies have changed. We come in today equipped with so much more knowledge than we did twenty years ago, and and yet that means that also the other guy has it right. But I would say this at least at least you know an observation. I think that there are two very, very indisputable ways to make a representation of the value that you bring with your entrepreneurship, you know, venture. You can show up with numbers which prove that you have cured diabetes or that you've done, you know, something wonderful. And if the numbers are correct and compelling, you win. It's that simple. Um, and that's how a lot of people in biosciences show that their product, their drug, their whatever, something is working really well, and that's fine. The other very side, the other extreme is to come forward with a vision of an experience that may already exist, you've already developed or you're developing in the future, that is indisputably, viscerally affecting the people that listen to you to say, yeah, I want to live in a world that has that. That is how I would envision my, you know, aging days or, or something like that. If you agree on that emotionally and viscerally, then you can peel the onion on how you're going to get there and how much funding you're going to need and who you need to collaborate with and all of that kind of stuff. But you start with that. In both cases, you're starting with, with something that people are not contesting. I think that there's a lot of people who are trying to go along the way in the middle who are saying, I have something that will have these features and functions, which will contribute, hopefully, towards a better future. And I think that is where you're going to find a lot of people in the room who say, well, I don't agree with you. These other features would do that, or, or these features won't work. And that's where it gets challenging. Um, but that is just my observation. Uh, very consistent, by the way, with your comment about 
the experience, you know, about a half hour ago with with the transaction in urgent care versus the experience in the everything else but that transaction part of the of, of the world. Mary, what's changed in healthcare that makes it even more difficult is um, the organ the buying organizations, health systems, for example, and plans have really gotten to the point where they they're reducing the number of partners they want to work with, right? I, I had a conversation not that long ago where someone said, I can't even remember the names of the companies I'm talking to, let alone figure out how to partner with them, right? So they want to move from that 60 to six vendor partners that I talked about. So if you're starting a company or you're running a company that's trying to scale, you know, I think the bedrock is to have a, a, a mission and values that are going to serve you well, regardless of the path that you need to take to get where you're going. But the days of having point solutions are over. And the challenge with that is, you can't just build a platform, right? Because it needs to be purpose-built. So you need to start with the problem. I think it's it's more imperative than ever to really start with a problem that's a real problem for somebody. Figure out who it's a problem for. And then, and it's pretty nuanced, but who are, what are the other problems you need to solve to give you permission to solve that problem? So for example, if you're trying to you know, help reduce readmissions, that's the problem. If you can define it and you can say, I can build a solution that's better than others out there to do it, that's great. But then you have to solve the workflow problem. You have to serve, you know, solve the engagement problem. You have to get all those constituents in healthcare, the patient, the, the frontline provider, the, the organization that's paying for it. And as we all know, it's very complicated. So it's always been the case, but I think you got to get there faster. You got to define the problem, really high relief, build a purpose-built solution, and then put that under a broader you know, set of uh, mission, vision, values, so that you can position it. That it may be a point solution now, but it can fit into someone else's platform, or we can raise money to grow a platform. So I, I think it's a challenge. I think it's exciting because I think those that figure it out, they'll be even a, a you know a, a wider moat more quickly. But the the bar has gone up considerably since COVID in healthcare. Well, I I, uh, I could talk to you both for a long time and would love to. We'll continue this conversation every few months to kind of make sure that we keep un- un- unpacking uh, the gems. But um, my biggest insight from, from this call comes from a comment you made, Murray, about the fact that you have um, everybody on your team still that want, that you want to keep on your team, that you're still there, that you guys both talk about each other and each other's capabilities and each other's organizations. So, you know, so uh, synchronized is is a real testament to both of of your leadership uh, style, skills, and, and cultures that you've built in your organizations. But I think a real a, a real um, moment for other entrepreneurs to 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 really see what is possible because there's so many stories about M and A and different transactions where the team leaves. By the way, coming from both sides, the big you know company doesn't do a good cultural integration, or the new company comes in like a bull in a china shop, but it's a beautiful story. I think the proof of what is to come is in the CBS partnership and this new dis- experience that you're creating to be more of a transformational experience for patients. I'd love to give each of you the last word, Murray first you, then Roy, and then um, hopefully have you, ba- have, have you back maybe at the next festival to continue the conversation and dig into the next six months. But Murray, last word. Yeah. Well, uh, well, first, my last word would be thank you. It's been a pleasure, obviously, talking with you. And I love, uh, Roy and I haven't spent uh, this much time together in a, in, in a while now. So we're, we're pretty busy. We haven't been able to coordinate. But no, it's been a pleasure. I think my last word would be um, kind of about, I'm, I'm going to try to the last end on where I think we're going as a company, but I think it's also instructive for where I think uh, entrepreneurs and healthcare need to go. I think increasingly the notion of data, we're becoming more of a data company. Um, analytics, but being able to do that in 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 extending trust. When you're trying to help healthcare scale, how do you take this very intimate trusted relationship and through data and technology and continue to have it be evidence based but yet personalized? Those things are all intention, right? Trust is the intimate relationship, and now you're trying to do it through technology and scale. Uh, you know, taking a lot of the activities that people perform out of it. Well, how do you do that and keep trust? How do you keep things evidence-based, which is reducing variability of care while you're increasing variability of experience, which is what personalization is? Um, I think those are going to be the the next challenges, and those are going to be the determinants of success for the the new crop of entrepreneurs coming out in healthcare. Excellent. Thanks, Mary. And Roy, thank you also for answering all the questions in the chat and Q&A. Rarely do we have a guest that actually just does it. I don't even have to read them out. So thank you for answering everybody's questions 
in the Q&A. The last word is yours, my friend. I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. I think it's a, it's a privilege to be at a place where, I don't know, we've been doing this for 15 years or close to 20 years now, and I feel like I'm sitting at the edge of my seat. And that is such a, such a privilege. It's driven by, by a lot of really amazing people that have joined part in this journey. Um, and it's driven by the fact that we're looking at a blue ocean in front of us in changing how people experience healthcare. I don't think there's been ever a time when so much transformation was just around the corner. Um, and I just want to thank everybody that's partnering it and a lot of people that join listening here that are going to be the leaders of the revolution, you know, going forward in a couple of years. Excellent. Well, thank, th thank you both for the front seat journey uh, to Conversa. Now, Amwell, uh, it's, great to, it's great to watch and hear and see um, what great execution looks like uh, up close. But congrats on all the success and look forward to having you back soon. There's uh, a couple of things just to make sure that we remind everybody of. Uh, we do monthly showcases that you can register for uh, every month, five to six entrepreneurs. I think Murray had done several over the years along with West. Uh, our Health Moonshot Showcase is getting a chance to meet investors, customers, and partners. For entrepreneurs looking to join Startup Health, um, go to startuphealth.com and click on join now. And then of course, follow us on social media, um, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. And look forward to seeing you on next month's Fireside Chat and seeing everybody at the Startup Health Festival in Vegas alongside Health, HLTH, uh, in November. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Roy. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm.